Wonderful. So uh, welcome very much uh, to William Patrick Murray to uh, Dublin Comic Con. We were just discussing your Irish roots just before the recording. You, you were saying your mother's from County Kerry. <laughs> yeah, and my father's people are from, I think, Cork and Galway. And uh, they were Bransfields, and there were two famous Bransfields. Edward Bransfield was a impressed uh, sailor with the British Navy who discovered a hunk of Antarctica before they knew what it was. And there's a memorial for him in his hometown. And we had another Bransfield who came to the U.S. and was an Indian scout during the Civil War who went back to Ireland on his pension. So that's, that's the two famous Bransfields. I'm the only famous Murray to my knowledge, but my knowledge doesn't go that deep. That's amazing. And have you ever made it over to Ireland yourself? Have you ever come? No, I never this? have. Um, I just never had the opportunity. I've been to England, which is close, but not Ireland, obviously. So no, I haven't. We, we'll forgive you for going to England before you came to see us. That's okay. <laughs> We'll, uh, but hopefully, who knows? Hopefully, in the future, we get to get you over here in person as well um, at, the, at the show. Um, now, listen, I'm really excited for this particular talk, and you were so good. In um, I reached out to you online, and you're so prolific, uh, particularly on Facebook, with the recent work that you've been doing. I say recent, but you've been at it a while with regards to uh, Doc Savage, uh, the Shadow, Tarzan. Sherlock Holmes, King Kong, the, the Wild Adventure series is, is, am I correct, is the umbrella that many of them um, come under. And for me, it's, it's been great because uh, I'm a huge comic book fan. Uh, often reading, of course, uh, Superman, and Superman would be known around the globe. But then what folks don't realize is, well, the Man of Steel, as he's known, was heavily inspired by the Man of Bronze, Doc Savage. In fact, it's Clark Savage and it's his fortress. He had his fortress forced up in the North Pole. Uh, so it's just been it, it, it's just been amazing for me to go back and then through your stories. You've been telling new stories, but it's still contemporaneous to the time of the original um, tales as well. So how how did this come about for you that you were able to work on projects like like these? And how's how's it been for you so far working on them? Well, it started a long time ago when I made contact with Lester Dent's widow, Norma Dent, who was the, you know, Lester Dent was the main writer on Doc Savage. And I visited her home in Missouri and went through his papers and I discovered a Doc Savage outline that was never used. And it, over time, cr crossed my mind that someone should write it and maybe it should be me. Because I, you know, I knew so much about Doc. So with her permission, I wrote a draft. I sent it to Bantam Books, which was then uh, publishing Doc. And they were very interested, but they wanted to finish reprinting the original stories. So uh, 11 years later, they published it. That was Python Isle, and they wanted two more. And I had that material that could be adapted for two more. And then we did s seven of them in those days. And then the industry kind of changed in terms of what kind of books the publishers wanted. And, but I never gave up reviving it. So in 2010, I got the rights to Doc Savage and we, we picked up where we left off. And there was a lot of Lester Dent material that could be adapted. He, he left unfinished manuscripts, outlines, etc. And so I was happily doing Doc Savage until a few years ago when they decided they wanted a modern Doc Savage and James Patterson and a collaborator at doing modern doc savages that's a long answer to a short question but there we are no no that's that's what we're here for it's it's, it's all gold and it's interesting you touched upon the james patterson stories as well because i checked out um his his shadow i think the shadow i don't know it's the doc savage one out for patterson i don't i don't think so but i know i checked out the shadow and that was a big departure from <laughs> it was a huge departure yeah the I, doc I was kind savage of shocked. is out i haven't read it but it is out Okay, okay. That, that see, I'm not. It's it's such a peculiar case study that one because it's it's not only a departure from what you would expect from the stories, but it's also, as I said, like I clearly, I'm into Doc Savage and the Shadow, and I'm not even aware that it's out already. That's that's kind of crazy as well. So one one has to wonder what way is it? Uh, are they marketing it as well? And what was great with the material that you were writing as well, um, because you of course have a 
comic book background as well. And Diamond, I we have comic book shops here in, in Dublin, in particular local store, Dublin City Comics. So I was I became acquainted with the uh, Doc Savage series through Diamond, the Diamond catalog, which has been great. And I know in the States now, it's kind of the, the Diamond kind of distribution's broken up more. So it used to be that they serviced everyone, but they still save Ireland and the UK because when they went to Luna and everyone else in the States, they uh, they forgot they haven't got a warehouse <laughs> to yeah. serve Europe. So we so we still have Diamond basically, um, which which has been great uh, for the for the stores here. Um, now with, with regard, so a lot of the material you're doing, you said you came across some Lester Dent material, um, and you were able to you know, uh, expand and then originate new material as well from that. But you're also able to make possible uh, um, like the type of stories that fans could only dream of, like the actual big team of, of The Shadow and Doc Savage. And I, again, I, I actually got around to those stories, like many people during lockdown, finally found, you know, the time to catch up with my reading. And what was amazing is the continuity in particularly in the shadows the shadow as a character is, is fascinating as a history because correct me if i'm wrong because i could get this wrong but he didn't originate in the pubs he originated as a character for radio and then his popularity led to him going into he, the pub. he originated as a narrator on radio a kind of master of ceremonies on the sinister side he did not become a character in terms of a personality with an alternate identity until the pulp magazine which was 1931 only maybe six months or so after the radio show started yeah and that's what's really interesting about his his origins that being that kind of a, a font of a better phrase convoluted from how he how he emerged um, into the pubs was the stories would diverge then because it's walter gibson who would have been the the main writer and the shadow one of the most prolific and it what's great is um the particularly if you buy the republished material now you'll find essays about the careers about gibson he had phenomenal records when it comes towards like typewriting like he had he kept he must have had like the world record or something i think it was when it came to typing he just it was, yeah. Yeah. it's it's incredible uh but what we ended up with the shadow then was a kind of divergent paths from his his story and background which would be uh the interpretation perhaps the face was you know, disfigured or hidden or makeup. And I found in the Doc Savage uh, Shadow crossover, the Force and the Sinister Shadow, you did such a wonderful job in giving harmony to that continuity as well. Um, and I, I say this to everyone, if they've never read the originals, I found this to be a great starting point as well for them, because if you have, because you do so well in like not introducing, but you kind of, I suppose, the contradictions that appear later, uh, you, you kind of have to give some harmony to that as well. Was that just an itch that you had to kind of scratch yourself as a fan to try and give cohesion to it? Yeah, because I don't think writing another Doc Savage novel or another Shadow novel or even a crossover is necessarily worth the effort unless you can do more with it. And part of doing more with it is to explore both characters. I have a philosophy that I've evolved that when you do a crossover like this, you first have to decide whose world is is the story taking place in. And in my first crossover with those two characters, the Sinister Shadow, I decided it was taking place in the Shadow's world, the, the world where there's a seedy underworld, the, the villain is scaled to the shadow size and not Doc Savage's uh, concept of a villain. And the events are localized to greater New York. Uh, and I, I, I wrote Doc a little differently like, than I would normally do. I wrote him, first of all, it takes place in the first year, more or less, of both these characters' careers, so they haven't quite developed. So I wrote Doc a little bit like through a Walter Gibson lens, where he's exactly who he's supposed to be, but he's seen, you know, um, in not quite the grandiose terms he later became, not quite the superhero. And I found that worked and I found that was interesting. There's an interesting backstory to this. In 1932, before Lester Dent wrote his first Doc Savages, he was given a shadow novel to write. It's called The Golden Vulture. And he had to do it two or three times before Street and Smith was satisfied with the, the version he turned in. 
I discovered just before I started writing this, there's a version I'd never seen that is so radically different. There were something like 22 chapters that did not appear in the final version of Golden Vulture that I could adapt into my story. So I built my story to some degree around that continuity. So in this sense, this book is Will Murray rewriting Lester Dent, who's trying to write like Walter Gibson. So you get the confluence of all three writers. It was a very unusual book to write. I love, I love writing it. I think it's a masterpiece of um, not just trying to weave the disparate elements together, but to do some of the things that would appeal to fans, such as the face issue, which Walter Gibson admitted that was an, an idea early on, but they walked away from it. They decided we didn't want that. It was too gruesome. So I cleaned that up. And at the end, there's a character who's revealed to become another character. And that was another thing that was, you know, cool about that story. So it was, again, trying to do something on a higher level than here's a slam bang team up between these two favorite characters. Yeah, and it's I, I cannot recommend it enough, particularly um, I remember when I went out to, to look up because I was just curious, it was one particular summer. Uh, and I was just curious to, to learn more about like Doc Savage in particular. But when I went around to secondhand shops in particular, there wasn't much material. And then lo and behold, in the diamond catalog. And then it, it, it and, you know, folks might sometimes feel and I don't know, it depends. It depends on the audience and the reader. But sometimes folks feel a little off put if something's set in a, in a contemporary time, like a time off its time. But I find particularly and maybe you might have noticed this become more sensitive. Uh, being a, a period writer of sorts that um, you have like Bridgerton on Netflix and, you know, The Crown and other events that are set in a particular time period, audience seem to resonate well with it. Uh, but one could argue perhaps they dilute ev little elements to make it more, you know, contemporaneous to today. Um, but for me, reading it, it was just, it, it was great. Like I didn't feel it was, it, it had to give me an, a nod and a wink to present day stuff. No, uh, I don't do that. Yeah, yeah, and that's it, and that that is so authentic. But at the same time, it didn't feel like I didn't know what was, what was happening because um, Sherlock Holmes is. Uh, you've you've written some Sherlock Holmes. I've written stories. forty something Sherlock Holmes stories. That's incredible. We have we have Sherlock and comics. I did a uh, uh, for Comic Con years ago. We did a, a short Sherlock Holmes uh, comic that we did for charity, and we had Mike Collins, who was the storyboard artist for the BBC Sherlock. Uh, do a pinup and it was more just kind of like a greatest hits of pinups really um but i found i was younger reading sherlock holmes that was something which uh was sometimes tricky was was Arthur Conan Doyle very much if you didn't know what this was he wasn't explaining it, it was just off the time um but sherlock how did you how did you feel um tackling sherlock because i find initially when i went to to do something with sherlock i, I thought about an original idea because we had at that stage, the Arthur Conan Doyle estate uh, and uh, whoever held the UK and I Irish publishing rights, we had them on board at the time. Well, I remember feeling so intimidated that I just faltered and said, let's play it safe and just adapt pre-existing material as best we can with a very limited original story. Um, what comes first for you as Sherlock? Is it, you know, the mystery or the idea of the story? Or is it like you just want to play in the sandbox with the characters? Well, I think I always want to play in the sandbox of the characters because since the sandbox is already constructed, it's a matter of adapting yourself to that. I, my Sherlock Holmes career started when uh, an editor at Moonstone Books asked me to do a Sherlock Holmes story for a team-up book called uh, The Crossover Casebook. And instead of using a fictitious character, I kind of cheated and I used Colonel Richard Henry Savage, a, an American military man and lawyer and author who uh, was a contemporary of Sherlock Holmes, who turned out to be the inspiration for Doc Savage and the Avenger, or a partial inspiration. So I played with that, and a few years later, I was asked to do a, 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 a story for an Australian anthology. Sherlock Holmes and Doctor was not, and the conceit of that anthology was Sherlock Holmes would be authentically Sherlock Holmes, and we would have a different Watson. We would create one or whatever. I cheated on that a little bit because Watson was part of the story and I had him meet 
H.P. Lovecraft's Dr. Herbert West. And that would seem to have been the end of my Sherlock Holmes career, but David Markham of the MX uh, Sherlock Holmes anthologies asked me to write uh, a story and I got finally a chance to write an authentic Sherlock Holmes without any crossovers. And then he asked me to write another and somehow it's gotten out of control. I've done more than 40. So that's how that came about. I feel a little self-conscious as an American who doesn't have a particular interest in the Victorian era to write these things. But as I mentioned earlier, my mother's Irish. My mother was Irish, she's no longer with us. And I was around a kind of pattern of speech growing up that wasn't that far from Victorian English. At least that's how I see it. So I kind of see that that it's, that influence is being significant here. I, uh, and, uh, and if, if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar can write a Sherlock Holmes story, I thought I could do one. You know? He has a great, it's it's Mycroft, um, and that was adapted into a comic as well, I think, his, his Mycroft series, if, if I remember correctly. I think he, he did one, which is really interesting, his um, kind of a, a prequel series of, of, of sorts. And um, in terms of actually, just because just I mentioned it as well, coming to, to comics as well, like you've had a very distinguished career in, in comics um, also. Um, what, what's interesting is the character of Squirrel Girl. I have to confess, I am, I'm an avid comic book reader, but Squirrel Girl was never much on my, on my radar as a character, but I am aware in, in the periphery of sorts. What, is, what did strike out to me, though, was you, you co-created Squirrel Girl with, with Steve Ditko, and here in Pulse College, we actually name our labs after uh, notable people in animation, games, sequential art anime. So we actually have a lab called the Ditko Lab. So oh, it'd cool. be remiss of me, yeah, it'd be remiss of me if I if I didn't ask um about your your collaboration with Mr. Mr. Ditko. Um uh, like were you uh, in correspondence with him much uh, when when if if you did work with him or, or was it uh, more just sending off materials and notes back and forth? Well I was asked to do an Iron Man story for a fill-in issue. And at that time, I had already been working with Marvel on the Destroyer Black and White series. And that was based on the Destroyer Paperback series, which I was ghostwriting at that time. So we had a lead story that might be 48 pages and we had needed backup stories. And I requested some of my favorite childhood artists, Don Heck and Steve Ditko, who came through and, and do stories. So I was already in touch with Steve when the squirrel girl thing came up. Now, the interesting story about that is that I was supposed to partner with an artist named Tom Morgan on that particular Iron Man story. And Tom, you know, was a big Iron Man fan and hadn't drawn the character in the story yet. So um, the story I heard many years later is that um, prior to Tom coming to the office, to pick up the script, Tom DeFalco, who was you know, editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, gave, told, told all his editors, look, Steve Ditko needs work. We owe him a lot for Spider-Man, Doctor Strange. Uh, if he comes in looking for work, give him something. It just so happened that Steve showed up in Tom, my editor, um, Howard Mackey's office, the day or the hour in which the script was on Howard's desk and Tom Morgan was sitting there ready to receive it. And, and when Ditko walked in, Howard just handed him the Iron Man script leaving for Tom Morgan out on a limb. You know, I'm sure they got him something else to draw. So that's how, you know, Steve came into this. So I would I was already working with him. Excuse me, just a second. No problem. I'll take your time well, again. Was, Thank you. Thanks so much. I just want to point out for the recording that you're actually down with a cold today and you've taken time out to talk to us. So yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah, we're happy to do it. So, you know, I talked to Steve about this. Now, he may, you know, he was very headstrong and he has his own view of things. In my script, which is a full script, despite the credits on the first story, which gave Ditko plotting credit, uh, I had described... Uh, Squirrel Girl is wearing forest green outfit, kind of like Robin Hood. <coughs> Excuse me. 
or a little bit, you know, my, my influence was largely uh, Mary Martin's Peter Pan, which I don't know that you guys saw that over in, in Ireland, but I grew up watching it on as a special on TV. And uh, when the art came back, the pencil art came back, she was in a completely different outfit. And I asked Steve about that. And he, he, he said, philosophically, a character should look like what they are. Spider-Man has webs. Iron Man should be metallic, things like that. So he, his, my thinking was squirrel girl would be up in the trees. So having a Robin Hood kind of outfit would be camouflage, but also appropriate for hanging around with squirrels in the forest. He thought she should have fur and she should look like, since she was 15 at the time, she should, or I assume, he didn't say this explicitly, but I assume he assumed a 15 year girl would throw together a costume out of whatever's around the household. I mean, she's wearing fur. I don't think she's wearing squirrel girl. She's probably wearing rabbit fur. It's what she could scrounge up. So um, he penciled it. We had a few discussions about a couple things. He improvised a couple things I didn't care for, but I, we, I went with it and I was very happy with it. Ultimately, I thought it was great working with him on a full length story. And of course, he's the guy who redesigned Iron Man in 1964. So I was thrilled to, to collaborate with him on an Iron Man story. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And, and for us, like for many of the fans, like Dicko, um, he, he's just like he's one of the giants, isn't he? Like the pillars in which like what Marvel uh, became today um, what was built on. Um, so that's like it's, it's such an amazing career that you that you've had, like from like key figures in literature like Sherlock Holmes to like the pulps which generated the genesis of so many of our heroes like Batman Superman's all generated from like the Doc Savages and the Shadows um and, and of course I'd be again would miss me again if I didn't mention the giant ape in the room as well where in your in your screen behind you there you have uh King Kong so Doc versus Kong and um this isn't the only story you've created as well with, with King Kong as being a, a Tarzan crossover, if I'm correct. Um, Tarzan, uh, King Kong versus Tarzan was our second King Kong crossover. And, it, you know, Skull Island, which is our Doc Savage King Kong crossover, uh, was our first crossover. And I had no idea when we were doing it, I was going to start a uh, career as a, the king of crossovers in terms of Pulp Fiction. But that's what happened because I've since done several crossover, including Tarzan and John Carter of Mars, of which the second book in that sequence has just come out. So, um, you know, it, these, these are all dream projects, but more significantly, these were projects that nobody thought was possible from a right standpoint or a permission standpoint. Uh, Marion C. Cooper, who created King Kong, fell in love with the idea of making a, a King Kong meets Tarzan uh, movie in 1935. He couldn't get the rights to either character and he thought he owned King Kong. So we, and, and Dark Horse years and years later in the nineties, started, started putting together a uh, King Kong Tarzan set on Skull Island graphic novel, but they couldn't untangle the rights. The key advantage I have is my cover artist, Joe DeVito is tied in with the Marion C. Cooper family excuse me <laughs> and he was able to work the deal for us and he was he had a connection to the Edgar Rice Burroughs people and that led to King Kong versus Tarzan and my connections with Kong and Astro on Doc Savage enabled me to do the two shadow meets Doc Savage and later I acquired the rights to the spider and had him team up with G8 and Operator 5 and other characters from that particular publishing house. So it's, it's pretty amazing in the sense that none of this was planned. My initial idea was to do maybe eight Doc Savages and that would be it. But it's turned into this little cottage industry of crossovers and, and related characters. And um, I, I noticed you, you mentioned the spider, which um, that was one of the rare occasions where I found it must have been an early nineties reprint um, of, of some of the uh, spider stories, but that's often cited by, I was cited by Stan Lee as one of the inspirations for Spider-Man as well. Um, it just, just even the name of the character, because Stan remember growing up with the, uh, with the pulps and um, I'm friends with Alex Saviak who worked with 
Roy Thomas and uh, and Stan on the Spider Man Daily strips, and that, that was interesting to hear Alex talk about the strips, is because um, they only existed, particularly with the rights of Marvel and everything, because Stan grew up. You know, the newspaper strip was such an important aspect of because there was like no color TV, colored entertainment was in the newspaper print itself. And I have a close affinity to the newspaper strip characters as well, because I published the, the, the Phantom. And often I, I go around, you know, correcting people who would who would point out, oh, you know, Superman's the fourth superhero. I'm like, oh, hold on. 1936, the Phantom came out, but it's the comic book comic strip. But what triggered it in my mind was when you mentioned the spider, I think the spider has the Phantom beat because he had the, the lighter which would leave the, the mark of yep. the spider. And I think the spider predates the phantom as well, is it? It does, uh, it does I, about three years, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's like the snake that eats its own tail. Here We go back yeah. and we go back and we find, like, it's all dominoes. They, they inspire each other as well, and they adapt over time. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and have you noticed that with the, with, with the evolution of the characters, each, each creator kind of brings their own not a particular spin. It's still clear the DNA of the character is is still there. But like taking the shadow, we mentioned Walter Gibson, but he wasn't the sole writer on the and the shadow as well. And the same for Doc Savage. There were multiple different different writers in in comic books. We break them down into like the Golden Age, the Silver Age, Dark Age, Modern Age, etc. In pulps, do they go through? that type of transition because i think there is a difference with doc between 80 doc and i think 1950s might have been where's the last doc savage like of the original 1949 one? 1949 okay so i would have come into that then um do do you like fans of the pubs and readers of the pubs they break it down into their own kind of a, a chronology do they have something that mirrors that of the, the comic book fandom Nobody does that, but the style from the early 30s to the late 30s did change, and the tone started changing radically around 1938, 39, 40. In terms of the fact that when, in part because you have to, you know, adjust, you know, the writing and the approach to the characters because the audience either changes or matures, and you have to, you know, you have to be lockstep with them. Just about every pulp, Doc Savage, The Shadow, The Spider, around 1938, 40, they be, there's a shift in the tone. It's not that early 30s gritty writing style. There's a little more humor in some of them, even in The Shadow, but not in The Spider. But there's a, tend to, there's a tendency to humanize the characters, to have them be less you know, impossible supermen. And those that survived the post-war era, which were very few, they um, the, the stories matured quite a bit more and became a little more sophisticated. And so they walked away from their pulp roots. But there aren't ages as such. They're not divide, divided that way by anyone. It's just we, we have to change with the times and sometimes with the shadow. When the radio program in 1937 with Orson Welles introduced Margot Lane and the, the, the thin man kind of approach, Mr. and Mrs. North kind of approach to Lamar Cranston and Margot Lane having solving mysteries. Walter Gibson became increasingly under pressure to write his stories more, at least parallel to the radio show and to include Margot Lane. He wasn't happy, but he went along with it because he wanted the magazine to continue. Yeah, and I, I just in terms of the, you mentioned humor as well. What's been fascinating for me is among younger readers, discovering the pub characters today. Uh, recently, uh, many are making memes of the characters, like humorous kind of abstracts, but they do so, what I found is very endearing, with reverence to the characters as well, like real insider um, kind of jokes, like how the shadow would be mysterious, to how the spider would go in, you know, with the hunchback and the guns blazing. Yeah. But then uh, it seems to be making a, a resurgence uh, among younger readers, which is which has been great to see, because we've seen in terms of comic books, there's been a shift towards in Western audiences reading more manga related um, content. It's it, like in terms you go into the into the bookstores now, you see that they have you know more more Japanese based comic book material. But uh, in terms of um, uh, like short stories and literature, the, the pulp characters, there's something just kind of 
uh, out there. Uh, and I think it's also an element of, you know, for so long they, they kind of became, you know, forbidden fruit for the older readers as well. Uh, I don't think the pubs, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the pubs got it as bad as the, um, or maybe they did when it came to the comic books in the 1950s. You have not right from as, not as bad in general, but some of them did get attacked. The weird menace pulps were basically put out of business in 1940 by various uh, pressure groups, and you know even the better pulps were sometimes lumped in with the the less savory pulps. So yeah, there there was a certain element of uh, of disapproval in certain quarters. There always is, no matter what you do. But I would say Street and Smith pulps had a very high a standard and some of the others did and some of the had less height the spider you know seemed to be aimed at a somewhat older audience but also an audience that you know wanted uh, was open to more violence and more suggestive material without you know being risque so it was tough you know the spider was for the there was a a guy named bob Sampson, a friend of mine who has passed on now who uh wrote a book on the spider and he said, you know, in his neighborhood, the tough kids all read the spider. It's, so, it, it's true. The character, they've, they seem to come back. Um, it's not that they even left, but it's just that they find kind of like Batman as a character. I heard Frank Miller once describe him as like a diamond, which is you can have Lego Batman or you could have Grim Gritty Batman, Adam West Batman, kind of, you know, the character holds up. With the Pulp characters, I've, I've read and enjoyed different interpretations of the characters. Like they have been adapted in comic book forms and live action film and serials um, with, with varying degrees of success, I suppose, in that regard. But there's something about the pubs where they kind of like the prose form seems to be like the, the best. There's something, something pristine about it. Um, do you have a personal preference in your gauge of the characters? Like, would you, if you were to say, script up a uh, a shadow comic as opposed to to a, to a pro story would your approach to it be different or would you just kind of break the story first um as well your, pro story? your approach has to be different because it's more visual and you probably don't have as much space to tell a story but my my feeling is to always try to um to extract the essence of a character or a series or an individual novel. When I wrote the Destroyer comic book for Marvel Comics, some of my stories were adaptations and some, many of them were originals. And what I would do with the adaptations is I would try to extract from the story liberally what needed to be on the page for it to be visual, to have page to page continuity and to work as a coherent story. You can't literally adapt a lot of novels to comic form no matter how many pages you have because people today for a long time they want a graphic novel to be a little bit cinematic so you know you can't have a lot of talking heads and you can't have a lot of background shots of of things in the far distance you have to it has to be in the reader's face so you have to be open to whatever it takes to turn this piece of prose to this graphic novel. Yeah, oh, that's, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Um, we're, we're just going to the time here for ourselves as well. I know in future me, he's probably prepping the, 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 the con room as well for the next panel. But before um, we wrap up here, if folks want to go out, find some of your work, um, read stories, like what would, be, what would be the best place to go to, to order in? Um, well, my books. book... My trade paperbacks and ebooks are on Amazon, and most of them are under the name Will Murray, but a lot of them, the Doc Savages, are under the name Kenneth Robeson. Uh, I also have a webpage, www.adventuresinbronze.com, where everything, including my, my collector edition hardcovers, can be ordered. So, www.adventuresinbronze.com. That's a good place to go to see all the covers of everything I have in print and whether you order them from me or Amazon makes no difference, but that's where you can find everything in one place. That's fantastic. I'll hopefully in our future on, I'm going to put this underneath the video when it goes out online as well. So folks should look below and there should be the link. 
Um, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time out here today to speak with us. And um, as I said, I'm a fan. Uh, I love it and I, I look forward to reading more as well. So thank you so much. And, well, thank uh, you, Austin, and I'm glad to uh, to uh, be um, a part of the Dublin Comic Con, something that, you know, I would never imagine that attending very easily because it's a long way. But uh, this has been fun. Uh, awesome. Thanks so much. Oh, all the best now. Thank you.